Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungy here on the Voice of Wrestling Podcasting Network. I am your host, Tyler Fornis. With me, as always, is Fred Moreland. And we want to apologize for not having a show last week. We recorded. It was a good show. And then it, during the editing process, found that the audio was corrupted and we were not able to get back together for another show because it is an insanely busy time for the both of us. Me with football free agency and the NFL draft approaching. And Fred, because he is writing questions for 17 year olds. Fred, how are you? I'm doing well. They're actually 19 year olds now. So, questions oh, are, okay. Are moderately hot, harder. Um, yeah. Uh, boy, uh, that FIO got bounced out just like the Kentucky Wildcats in the NCAA tournament. There's one thing I cannot trust. And that, is, and that is a team laced with a bunch of one and duns going and doing anything in the NCAA tournament. When you face a real, a senior laden team, even if they're a mid major, you can't replicate chemistry. You can't replicate like all that, the, all that time together, understanding and the development raw talent only gets you so far. That's why Kentucky, I believe only has one national championship under Calipari, despite uh, the over decade of success. Yeah, I will say um, it's ESPN's hard to win a national championship. Though. <laughs> it's really yeah. hard these days. ESPN's Jordan Reed, who covers uh, football, but he is actually um, fun fact, uh, Chris Paul, NBA point guards cousin. So he knows a little thing or two about basketball. He said, it looks like they're an AAU team that only gets together and plays tournaments on the weekends, but doesn't really practice at all. And I think, I think that's apt. You have to have a true team. And that's why you're seeing lower seeds have a lot more success nowadays than they used to. Yeah, it's a fascinating situation. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, um, I, I live in Kentucky, and I'm a I'm a Kentucky fan by way of student loans. Uh, but I wasn't like one growing up. You know, I like to see them do mm-hmm. well. I'm not exactly a diehard though. At the same time, this I actually last night may have been the uh, I think that's actually the first game I watched all year, just because you know I, yeah. I'm not a big men's basketball or men's college basketball fan. Um, but let me tell you, Thursday and Friday, first weekend of the tournament. Oh, it's oh, fun. It's always it's, fun. You don't even first have weekend. Even, you don't even have to be invested in any of the teams to just have a good time and watch basketball because there's always some rando mid major that just does a bunch of stuff and it's just fun. It's good. Like I love it. I, I think this love. is this is the first time it actually feels like Calipari could get shit canned. Um, good. Which you know I don't know. Like I think he's done pretty well here. But like people, you know, the the super diehards were like wanting to fire him in 2016, and it's like he just went 38 and one the year prior. I mean, let's mm-hmm. you know bring it down a notch, maybe. Um, but the past, ever since the the tournament, the pandemic tournament got canceled, uh, the last four years uh, we have won. As uh, as Tyler holds a dog up, uh, we have uh, one not even making the tournament, and three like embarrassing early exits um and it's not good i don't think uh that's that's gonna do it so i could actually see him uh, getting fired and someone i saw someone say well they'd have to pay 34 million dollars and um the first thing that just popped in my head was jimbo fisher you know because <laughs> you make boosters angry enough and those boosters are rich enough then uh, uh that that don't matter <laughs> so uh, I, I no longer think it's like a guarantee that uh, that they won't be able to find someone as good as Calipari. I, I yeah. do think he's a he's a successful coach. I think he's a good coach, 
but he um i don't know it's it's been a rough little go here um we haven't made a sweet 16 since 2018 or i'm sorry 2019 i apologize um Mm -hmm. one tournament win since uh since then uh you know i don't know i I, i'm not really endorsing firing him but i get it Uh, for the first time since i've been here it's it doesn't sound like crazy people talk um now i'm not allowed legally to say that uh you know uh the upset was good because i'm afraid of death squads dressed on blue uh but in general upsets are very good so and like really if you ask me i'm really a marshall fan and that's just kind of like not a real thing you know in comparison <laughs> so fred just admit it you're afraid of your wife i okay. i made some comment last night about well you know it's cool to see an upset and she just like death stared me i was like oh yeah this isn't the right time no it is not the right time i remember i took my brother to a wild game for his birthday and we got to watch him play against Alex Ovechkin, one of the great hockey players of all time. Ovechkin got a hat trick in the wild loss in overtime. And he was pissed. I'm like, dude, you got to see Ovechkin score a hat trick. And they got a point. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. okay. He's like, no, I'm like, <laughs> all right, whatever. I remember back in college, um, I, you know, like maybe my freshman year, a group of people got together to watch, uh, the Seahawks Steelers Super Bowl. And as a Vikings fan, I had no skin in the game. So I was like, all right, I'll cheer for the Seahawks. Sean Alexander's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, like this was late in the game where it was just a total blowout. The Steelers were up like 42 to 10 or whatever the hell it was. And um, uh, Seattle had not been able to do anything on offense at all. And they got like their sixth uh first down and i was telling everyone earlier in the game oh you know the apparently seattle fans do this silly thing where if you if they get a first down they all chant like or you know they all say together that's another seattle seahawks first down so i jokingly said it and i got death stares from some steelers fans and i was like you guys are up by three four touchdowns it's the fourth quarter you don't have anything to worry about you're talking the super bowl right yeah yeah that was a 21 to 10 game that it wasn't was, the it was, game. I remember it being decided. Like it was just like Seattle had nothing going. So oh no, that part is true. The score yeah. just wasn't was a lot closer than it you felt would think. Like it was uh it was that big of a margin. Yeah. But uh yeah, that was the other time that I uh nearly uh entered hell because of uh you know, just a, a mild sports statement. Hey, listen, I've I've done worse, so you fans are bad. sickos. Oh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. And the, I can you know say that. Is, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. You know what else is sicko? Northwestern Florida Atlantic, 125 to go, 56 all. Let's go, baby. This is March. Boy, Fred, you me record during the tournament. I can't, I can't believe he would do this to me. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, college basketball sure don't have offense on the men's side. <laughs> no. Some but, but atrocious remember, Florida, scores. Florida Atlantic was like one second away from making the final last year. Yeah, they were really good last year. Um, I hope they, uh, it's fun to see the smaller schools do well, especially yeah. after the SEC commissioner says this week that uh, maybe we should just have major conferences in the tournament. It's like, you dumb asshole. God, it's just really amazing to see how they, I mean, I, I know why he would say it because they want the money, but like, it's obvious that the thing that, that makes the money here for March Madness to me is the smaller schools pulling the upsets. And then you get a cheer for FAU or Loyola Chicago or whatever. And, uh, you know, love our late stage capitalism sports. Uh, mm-hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Great stuff. Let me tell you. And you know what else is great stuff? AEW the last few weeks. And yes, sir. Because of our early recording before the Kazuchika Okada debut, we haven't had a chance to talk about that. Mercedes Monet. So we're going to give some big picture thoughts on what has happened in the world of AEW over the last couple of weeks, because we feel bad that we haven't really been able to talk about this stuff. So let's start off with Okada, Fred. Yeah. He debuted uh, when the Young Bucks were making their special announcement, and he ended up giving a rainmaker to Eddie Kingston. And on an overall level, I honestly don't know if you could have done a better job of debuting Kazuchika Okada and utilizing him. I I can understand, hey, you don't want him to come in as a heel. He's friends with the Bucks. He wants to work with the Bucks. They have him join the elite and fire Kenny Omega day one. Within 
15 minutes of Okada being in the company, he's got programs set up with Eddie Kingston, Kazuchika Okada, and then later that week against Pac. They're making him look like a million dollars. I think you've been saying Kenny Omega that second time. But also uh, Hangman Page, too, a little bit there at the... Hangman's just suspended, so I I don't really know how that's going to play out, but you have a good point. Yeah, They've made him look like a million bucks. They've integrated him onto television. The bit with Alex Marvez is just hilarious. Okada's speaking Japanese, and Matt Jackson keeps talking about his Duolingo streak. (laughs) It's, It's just tremendous stuff. And... You look at everything, like the trios match against the jobbers. Mm-hmm. Okada doesn't even tag out and he just beats the piss out of them. Yeah. Just like you couldn't have asked for better. The fan base already knows Okada. So everybody who potentially doesn't it, the mythical monolith of the casual fan, they look at this guy a million fucking dollars and he's just beating the piss out of everybody. I, I you really could not have done a better job of getting him into this company and the worries about television wrestling in America. Yeah. I think he's going to be just fine. He's a natural for it. Oh. What, it what it is. Um, God, he's just uh, hit the ground running. Um, I, I, I get why people would not have wanted him to be a, um, you know, a uh, baby or a heel coming in. Cause you know, you think initially it's the, it's an easy face run, right? You know, you you get the superstar coming in, and you uh, immediately, uh, you know, have him come in, and everyone wants to cheer for him because they're like, "Hey, we got Kazuchika Okada. He's here. It's awesome." And um, you know, the sim- simple fact is, you know, I think he's always one would say, I think he's always been better as a as a heel, just naturally, as far as his charisma. Obviously, the uh, the New Japan baby face run in the last few years, except for being grumpy about young guys, uh, worked out pretty good too. Let's not kid ourselves. But all that yeah. said, he is great as a heel, and I think we're just seeing that. You know, um, he is, I think, having a fantastic run already. Uh, there's no adjustment period; like he is just ready to go, and it's awesome to see. Uh, I think. Uh, funnily enough, considering how much uh, Eddie Kingston likes Japanese wrestling and patterns himself after that, I don't think he works well with Eddie Kingston. Or maybe it's just me like focusing on the Rainmaker, which Eddie Kingston seemingly can't take well. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I think that's a that's a perfectly fine starting point for Okada. Um, mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think he's going to be a major U.S. star. I I think it's a uh it's a complicated answer when it comes to working with Eddie Kingston. Kingston is really good at working like the Kings road style where you just throw people on their heads and you you just beat the piss out of them. And I don't necessarily think that's Okada's best usage. That's his forte. So when I, I like, I thought the match was fine. I didn't think it was great. Like, I really didn't have any issue with that. I gave it three and three quarters. I thought they worked really hard, but yeah, sometimes I did too. don't have great chemistry, but it was yeah. also like the first time one-on-one they'd ever been in a ring together. Sometimes it just takes people more than one instance to really get like the cadence, the flow, the understanding of, Hey, this, that, and the other things so you can build off of things. I don't really have, uh, an issue putting them together again. I think you could get a much better match out of them, but sometimes it's just a little rougher on the edges. And we'll talk about rougher on the edges when we get to hook and Chris Jericho here in a little while. But I think the really cool thing about Okada is he is here. He is not just, Hey, I'm going to be a special attraction. I am the attraction. And they have not wasted any time getting him acclimated, getting him in an awesome program with the Bucks, getting him against cool ass wrestlers. How awesome is it going to be to see Okada versus Pack likely a dynasty? Okada versus Pack. That's like if you would have talked to me 2019, like the best dream matches you could have put together that's in professional wrestling. That's probably top ten. Like the styles are completely different, but pack works so well with any kind of wrestler that I just think that 
would be a phenomenal match. That was when Pac was having that run in Dragon Gate, which is kind of why I talked about like 2019. Uh, and he had that, or maybe that was 2018, where he had that awesome Dream Gate run. I remember his match against KZ was just special. Like, I think that match was like 12th in the Voices of Wrestling uh, match of the year poll that year too. But it's one of those things. Like, I think you're going to have a lot of a lot of instances where Okada is just going to have really cool matches, but maybe they just don't peak as high. And I think TV matches three and three quarters, four stars. I think you're talking about like a core and trios match. Like that's kind of what you're going to get. And I think that rocks. I think it's awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm very excited for that match. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a really cool time. Uh, but for as great as I think that uh, that Okada has been in AEW, and I think he's been great uh, since day one, uh, I think Will Ospreay is an even um, even better fit in for US TV style wrestling. Uh, that guy, I underrated how how much of um, how much of a promo he is, mm-hmm. and uh, he has just been knocking it out of the park. I think with uh, his couple of uh, long promos uh like actual like tv style promos and he's just a natural and on top of his pro wrestling you know in ring ability um he is great it's just amazing he's got to be the best in the world right now and like i was saying that last year but i mean just in general best in the world right now don't you mean ever look that's just uh that is a high mark you know ever is just a high mark um if you think he is the best ever, or not he's in the conversation. He's got he's in the combo, yeah, for sure. To me, that's it, it's indisputable that he's in the conversation. Yeah. Um, Florida Atlantic just missed a one and one, and they're up two with twenty seconds left. Let's go! This is March, baby, and it, this game will be over by the time you listen to it. I don't care. This is fun. <laughs> it's yeah, I don't yeah. I mean, why not? Let's do it. Um, Ooh, I did not uh, mind. Okay. First up, little white boy just tied the game. Six oh. seconds left. What are you doing? Oh my gosh! What an awful possession. They six seconds left. The guy just like stands there and then takes an awful shot. So it's overtime. Just incredible lack of awareness. It's it's like uh, I don't know. I I don't have a good wrestling comparison for lack of awareness, but it, it's there. So Matt Hardy yeah. yelling at Jeff Hardy in the aughts. There, we, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I agree with you. Will Osprey comes off like the biggest star in professional wrestling. Uh, the reactions to him are so genuine. They're loud. They're passionate. And then the the Osprey chance. L- let me ask you a question about the Osprey chance because when they kind of started in Japan, it felt really organic. Yeah. And. Yeah. That's kind of how it came about. And a lot of really cool wrestling things start off as organic. So it's not to say that it's necessarily bad, but it, it feels less organic and less cool now than it did like a month ago. Do you kind of get that same feeling? It, it, and it's not to say that we shouldn't be doing it and it's not cool, but it just feels different. I think maybe to a lesser extent than the the CEO chance in Monet's theme. I think that feels tremendously forced um, and is kind of not cool as a result. Um, if, you know, honestly, I think it actually would have been kind of smart to uh, to have the, the chance in the theme for the first week. And maybe they're going to do a couple of weeks of it, but then take them out and just have the fans lead it along. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Yeah, I um, I do think that the way the Osprey theme really emphasizes the chance, and I don't know if that's a change or not from like a year or two ago in New Japan. Um, I, I just can't recall offhand. Uh, but I do think that you could argue that's uh, you know a little too uh, forced, I guess, as Northwestern goes up to in overtime. Um, and I, I just, you know, I, I get it. Um, it doesn't bother me as much with Osprey, maybe just because it's been going for a while. But I, I do think the Monet thing, and I this could be a segue, I guess, if we're done with Osprey, um, is that, um, 
you know, with Monet, it's so blatant in her theme that I think it's a little distracting. But, you know, God, American wrestling fans just love chanting stuff. Like, Oh, God, yes, they do. So much. Um, it, I don't know that it really matters. Maybe this is just me being an old man, you know, waggling a cane, you know. I, I don't know. But, I I mean, I, I think that regardless, like, Osprey is way more over than I think anyone could have reasonably expected like it, it was undoubtedly that he was going to be a star right in, in uh aw uh i think it was undoubted that he was going to be a, a big star but he just feels like the hottest guy in wrestling right now and um i did not expect that without him having worked a match in aw yet yeah I figured it would have come after a great match where people would be like, oh, man, you know, uh, this guy really is the best entering guy in the world. Uh, but he's been cutting these great promos. And um, I don't know. I, there's a lot of year left. There's a lot of stuff to happen. But he feels like he's already on the uh, inside position on uh, the Fez Flair Award. Yeah. And I, I think to kind of go off that point, I think part of the issue is, he had a five-star match against the Kesha that nobody remembers because Darby Allen jumped off a 15 foot ladder through a, a pane of sugar glass. Yeah. Like there I guess three... I should have said, said TV match for Osprey, yeah. not just oh. match period. Sorry. Well, what about Kyle Fletcher? That, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I forgot these matches that. happened. Sorry. Uh, well, Osprey is so good. We don't even remember the great matches. I'm he just had. dumb as like, hell. Uh, well, that's evergreen. We know that, Fred. <laughs> it's a it's a known thing. As Northwestern nearly loses the ball, and uh, frankly, I think this is how Lanza should be doing his shows. By the way, uh, Northwestern just hit a big three. Um, is just oh, you're ahead half- of me. I'm uh, oh, it's sixty two fifty eight. Um, with uh, Florida Atlantic th- hitting sh- or missing three fro- free throws, I guess. Bad news for you that uh, if you're a FAU fan, um, I I seriously think if. Joe doesn't listen to the show. Uh, I don't know if anyone does, uh, but I do think this would actually be pretty cool if uh, Joe was doing his uh, flagship pluses and just like openly talking about the games that were on. Yeah, that would be, that would be great. Uh, yeah. Gosh, live commentary from Lanza just yelling at people for playing bad defense and not yeah. hustling the ball would be awesome. Do a live stream like in the middle of the afternoon and just be like, "Look, I will talk about." Uh, whatever wrestling story, but also I'm going to yell about uh, Northwestern building on their lead now to eight. Um, this is almost over. Jeez, eight. Um, the, the three just happened for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is funny because I'm always behind uh, people on, uh, even when I'm able to watch it live on Dynamite. Um, I, I seem to always be like 10 seconds behind. Uh, anyways. I'm on my gimmick, so I, it's not yeah. like, uh Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, Osprey, I think, is way overachieved. Uh, has been just an amazing addition. And um, I think that's cool as hell. Um, I, I don't, you know, <laughs> I feel like it's very simplistic commentary to uh, to just be like, well, uh, Will Osprey is good at professional wrestling. But, like, he feels like he's just... Even the parts of the game that maybe you wouldn't think that he was naturally, you know, that that are easy to overlook, maybe would be the better way to put it. Um, he has just taken off, uh, had a fantastic go, and uh, as far as the first weekend, and that's that's really cool. It is really cool, and I think this trio of signings. I think I mentioned this before on the show, Fred where is going to be very similar to when they added punk Adam Cole and Brian Danielson. Yeah. I don't think that it's an equal comparison. I'm not saying that it's one-to-one the bringing in CM punk was a moment that I don't think you'll ever be able to replicate in professional wrestling again, because there's so many layers to it. He had not wrestled professionally in seven and a half years. The whole reason AEW began a movement was because of CM Punk, the voice of the voiceless, all that stuff. So it was just a special time and era in this company. But I think the addition of these three, along with the the shift back to what AEW was going into that era, that 
push of those three wrestlers, you're looking at a, a potential like really massive wave moving forward because you have this influx of great talent and they're going to be able to deliver for you on major levels. I think that this could be a hell of a lot of fun. It, it's going to mean great matches. The storylines have already improved. Everybody feels rejuvenated. We could be setting ourselves up for an incredible summer that culminates at Wembley Stadium. Yeah. Um, I just, it's, uh, that is a 11 point lead for Northwestern with 96 seconds left. That's over. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a big year for them. And it's a nice way to turn around from last year's, uh, kind of a hot mess of year. Um, I think that, uh, you know, these three editions all at once are a big deal. I think bigger than if they'd come separately. You know, the fact that they're all debuting like within a month um, is pretty awesome. And I think really feels like a massive deal. Um, and um, I think it's really reinvigorated the company. Now I'm a little, you know, there's always the don't get too WWE if I, because they do need to feel like a separate company. Mm-hmm. Uh, a separate product like that's that's has to be their uh core value i think as a company for aw is they have to prove that they are different uh, and they have to stay different uh because you're never going to be able to out wwe wwe you know the the people that mm-hmm. like that are just going to you know what like i think a lot of people that um you know back when uh you know like they were getting a lot of booze at events in like 2015, 2016. I think a number of those people didn't really want an alternative company. I think they just wanted WWE to be better. And I think those people are happy right now. Um, uh, so, yeah. I kind of finish that point off. I also think sure. what AEW really has going in their favor is now you you may and the flag should mention this and we've talked about this on the show before in the past sometimes with a company like this you just need time and the reason why you need time fred is because eventually your product is going to become normalized and when your product becomes normalized that means that it's in the culture for x amount of time and younger wrestlers like like nick wayne five years ago was 13 years old <laughs> yeah if you uh, barely a teenager like you become a wrestling fan most often between like the ages of, I'd probably say eight and 14 so because good. you're younger, but you're and you're still relatively impressionable. So you become a, a younger fan. Well, now you're starting to see two promotions and you're, it, the dream may not necessarily be to wrestle for WWE. It may be like, I want to go to AEW. They have the best matches. They have Kenny Omega. They have Hangman yeah, yeah. Page. They now have Will Ospreay. And this is where you can start to see a real paradigm shift. And I think one of the interesting things about WWE is whenever those paradigm shifts have happened historically, when Vince McMahon was in charge, he had a counterpunch. He had something ready to go to improve his product and keep him at the top of the mountain. And regardless of all the outside scummy stuff that Vince does, which is abhorrent and he should not be in charge. I'm genuinely curious if anybody in that company is going to have that counter punch that Vince had, because that's how the Monday night war started. Vince had the counter punch. He's like, no, we got to do the attitude error. Not that he wanted to, but he knew that's what he had to do to succeed and to survive. WWE is not necessarily in a position where they're going to die, but you can lose massive market share. And by losing that market share, that's a hindrance to your company. So how are you going to keep yourself at the top of the mountain? How are you going to adapt? Because if you don't adapt, that could be a really, really bad thing for your future. And I'm curious, does triple H have that? Does Anybody else in that booking creative room have that? I have no idea, but it's something that I'm going to be monitoring here really closely over the next few years. How are they going to adapt? Cause they're losing on free agent battles and 
it could be just because they don't want to spend the money. It could be the UFC model. Yeah. But how are you going to change to adapt to what your marketplace has become? That's going to be fascinating to me. I half agree with you. I, I agree with you that it, it's a very good question to see if Paul Levesque, if he continues to be the head booker, uh, as one presumes, uh, if he is able to shift gears, because I think what we've seen from him, even from the early days of, you know, like WWE Network NXT, is that he prefers like a very steady kind of product, uh, just like content to inch forward there's not very many like earth shattering events it feels like in wwe it feels like you know you go on a path and you're there uh Mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily a bad thing uh but i do think that uh you know at times you have to have momentous occasions in professional wrestling to help keep people's interest um and i think like if you look at the roman Reigns storyline that's going on uh it feels like it's been going on for 10 years at this point, though that's you know obviously an exaggeration. Um, but I think that, um, you know, they, at some point you would think that they would need to wrap that up and have something happen coming out of it. Um, and that's something not just be like the judgment day replicating the whole who's in charge of the st- heel stable kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That said, I don't think that at any point in the, near future um i i just can't foresee in the next three maybe five years though five is a lot uh but i just can't foresee in the next three years anything really threatening wwe for the top spot in the industry uh even as good as AEW is just because of the inherent advantage of wwe being huge um and i feel like what it would take is uh wwe just going back to, you know, the self-destructive late era events booking of the, uh, the 2010s. Um, that was so bad that it created opportunities for like, what should have been also ran companies in the U S like ring of honor and new Japan, uh, from like actually being looked at as even minor threats to WWE. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, uh, kind of unlikely to happen with Paul Levesque unless he just lets things get so stale that fans get tired of it. And at this point in time, it doesn't feel like that's we're anywhere close to that. That can change quickly, but I, I just don't have that vibe off the fan base. It feels like everyone's like really into like WWE fans are just really into what they're doing, uh, what the company WWE is doing. And I just don't foresee that changing imminently. So the one counter I have to that is at WrestleMania this past year, Cody didn't finish the story and fans started to turn. And then you had uh, Triple H or Paul Heyman. I can't remember who said it in the post-show presser that they were only in the third inning of this bloodline story. Well, the fan base really wanted to see Cody beat Roman for that title. They wanted him to finish the story. If he doesn't finish the story now, what is that going to tell the fan base? Because we have to remember the majority of the fans that were uh, frustrated with the product that didn't like the product anymore, that were the loudest about it. They're gone. Yeah. I do think the the loudest are gone. They, they are down to their core fan base that likes everything. So if they piss off that core fan base, well then what happens? And that's why like that counter punch does Paul have it. And that's, or I'm curious. And I don't think it's a, Hey, I have to have an answer now. I think with AEW where they're at and they could get that massive TV deal. The second they get that massive TV deal, it's, it's like an equal marketplace because they're going to be here to stay that it won't be Tony running in the red because that he has billions of dollars. The cons could buy WWE like seven times and not run out of money. So you're talking about like super billionaires. It's, it's like me. I, I can buy like 400 McDonald's cheeseburgers if I wanted to right now. And I would be okay. Yeah. Like I'm not rich. I'm middle class. Well, I, I don't know that you would be physically okay. <laughs> I didn't say I was eating them. I just said buying them. But that's where I, I really just want to see the evolution of how this quote unquote wrestling war continues because it could be an actual like war 
It -hmm. could be two companies just coexisting. It could be AEW taking over the top spot. WWE could stand on top of the mountain until I die. We genuinely don't know. There's just so many pieces of information that we need to see. And I want to see what kind of evolution that WWE is going to have. Cause right now they don't have any. Yeah. Um, it's really, uh, it's really inter- an interesting time, much more interesting than it has been actually, in a, I think a pretty good while in uh, the U S for pro wrestling. And um, I don't know, as you know, for all the people, you know, there's some people who are like, oh, AEW is going to go out of business. If Tony Khan like goes into this with the full like 1990s George Steinbrenner mindset, you know, like I just want the best product I could put on. It's not like he's going to run out of money anytime soon, you know, barring like the greatest fishing scheme ever orchestrated <laughs> or something like that. Right. Um, somehow he loses the, the Jacksonville Jaguars. <laughs> In a phishing email, which would actually be kind of funny, um, just in the abstract. Uh, but yeah, like I just cannot envision, you know, like him, like even if they, I, I, you know, what if they lost the TV deal? Like, would he just stop spending? I can't imagine that. Frankly, I think he just waited until he got another TV deal and keep it going. You know, but Tony could just buy a TV station. He could. He could go the the impact route with um, access TV, you know, you get a hundred percent by some cable station. That's just out there. And just be like, all right, this is the centerpiece uh, for AEW right now. It's going to be fascinating to see how this evolves over the course of time. We kind of devolve from just the fact that, Hey, you're going to start getting young kids who want to go to AEW because that's what they grew up with. And yeah, how are things going to evolve in this wrestling where it's going to be fascinating. And one of those things is, the free agency battle. And let, let's talk about the debut now of Mercedes Monet because we talked Actually, about before we go to that, I just had a thought. I apologize for that. I do think maybe that there is an internal problem with WWE in the sense that maybe they just think that, well, everybody wants to work here. So why should we make a good money offer or make allowances for their outside interest? I'll love Mercedes Monet and AEW uh, and Will Ospreay with his clothing line. Um, because uh, I just remembered that um, several years ago when, uh, they were kind of sniffing around buying stardom the part of the, they didn't offer much money, but they told Rossi Agawa, well, what we can do is we can put you into the WWE hall of fame. Ooh, the WWE and, hall uh, of fame. and shockingly that didn't really move the needle. And I, I do wonder if they're so used to dealing with people that are Marks. like that, that, yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to use that word, yeah, like people that are just obsessed with WWE that do see WrestleMania as the biggest thing that anyone could accomplish in professional wrestling, um, that, you know, they aren't going to be able to adjust, possibly. You know, I'll just float that. I don't know, like, I, it's a possibility. I, I could see them, you know, just being that cocky that, um, well, we are the biggest company, so why wouldn't people want to work here? We can save money and not offer them full value on their contracts. Uh, and that, you know, I, I don't know if they're going to learn that lesson. No, I don't think so. Um, they're at least not learning it yet, but I think it's also a different business model that right now, WWE is at a point where just being in WWE, like the brand runs the show, the talent doesn't, which is such a unique concept. And especially like when you look at other sports, like I, I think you could argue Major League Baseball has some of that because they're also absolutely atrocious at marketing their own talent. They're so bad at marketing their stars. I, I bet half the world couldn't even tell you where uh, Shohei Otani and uh, Mike Trout play baseball. Like, uh, sorry, half of America because they don't do enough to promote their big stars. Yeah, I feel and, like Otani is their one like actual breakthrough star the past fifteen years. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, but like Mike Trout, who is going to be like an inner circle Hall of Famer, like is just the most, you know, mundane human being possible, you know? Yeah, he's just chill. And, yeah. You know, nothing wrong him. with that. No, nothing wrong with that at all. But it just kind of speaks to the point that you have. I think Major League Baseball is kind of in the same way where people go to, to the ballpark to go watch Major League Baseball. Yeah, they don't necessarily go to watch one player. 
Whereas, hey, AEW is coming to town. I want to go see Okada. I want to go see Osprey. Like that's kind of like the major difference. And I think that's a big reason why they're not actively trying to get all these high-end free agents because I don't think they think they need them. And it's because WWE is the draw. WrestleMania sells out every year, pretty much. Without effort. WrestleMania. Yeah. There is no match announced. Nothing is announced until like after um, the Royal Rumble, like, except for the rare occasion, like, oh, Cena versus The Rock was announced one year in advance. Okay, that's cool. We're filling out MetLife Stadium, all right? That's exceedingly well, rare, though. It is exceedingly rare. WWE is the draw, not the talent. And AEW is in the exact opposite spot, so they need the free agents. They need the top names. WWE doesn't. I think that's it. Whether that business model continues to work or not is uh, up to be seen, which is why I talked about the, the like the future and Vince McMahon always had a counter punch. Is WWE going to have a counter punch? I don't know. And I'm fascinated to find out, but one of those free agents was Mercedes Monet. Yes. And she signed with the company. She debuted a big business last week and it came out that she really wanted to have outside endeavors. She wanted to be able to build her brand. She wanted mm-hmm. to be able to do Star Wars and music and fashion and be able to build a portfolio that way. Tony was all in for it. Doesn't seem like WWE was. And remember, one of the big things with WWE, they ended up taking Twitch streams from their talent yes, and saying, nope, they are ours now. And you are just going to get a cut of this money. I'm like, what? No, like I think about how much revenue they were making. Like they didn't need that money, you know, but that was just uh outright greed, I think, on their part. And um I think that that's going to be a long term issue, I think, for them. The kind of foolishness. One hundred percent. But Monet debuts last week. She mentions Willow right away. Uh, she goes out in the main event to save Willow. And I think it was Mike Johnson or maybe it was Wade Keller. Somebody had the minute by minutes. And apparently at one point during that final segment, they did have over a million viewers for about like five, six minutes, but the overall segment wasn't, didn't do very well. I am. I think I'm remembering that correctly. That sounds uh, about right. And she saves Willow. Willow's like, welcome back. And then this past week, uh, Willow and, Chris Statlander go out to uh, help Monet because you had Julie Hart and Sky Blue out there. Well, Willow kind of like thinking about hitting her with a chair. And now we're starting to get some beef, starting to get some tension here. And I think this is objectively good. I'm, I'm excited to kind of see where this all ends up. And so far I, I still think Monet is living off the, Oh, I'm just happy to be here. And she's just a little too bubbly. I'm still a little bit worried long-term about her overall package as far as a promo. But I do think that there is a lot to like here. I I think her day, her, her AW tenure as of now, Fred, I put it at like a B plus. I think it's overall been positive, but I want to see how things develop. I want to see her get in the ring. I want to see how she can develop some of these promos because the promo, like the original promo I thought was good. But after that, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. um, I think there's um, kind of a big question about, you know, just what it's going to be like uh, when she's, you know, really been around for a little bit. Uh, But I think the, you know, I don't think her promos have been great, but she's never been a great promo. Um, she's still getting fantastic reactions. Um, and I feel like I saw somebody compare it to uh, Soraya, and I think that's off just because she's gets big reactions where Soraya didn't, you know, for a while. You know, it, it felt like Soraya dropped off like really fast in AEW. And we're two weeks in, so small sample size theater. But I just don't think that um, there's really any sign that that's going to happen yet with Mercedes. Now, I will say that um, 
you know, we talked about Okada the coming in and immediately being a heel and how that was, uh, you know, some people didn't like it, but it doesn't seem like an issue to me, at least. I do wonder, I feel like they're already teasing that Mercedes is going to go heel. And I feel like with her, it's important to keep her baby face at this point in time. But the problem with that is I think she's not a particularly good promo. And I feel like she's even worse at being a baby face on the mic than she is as a heel. Um, I think she's kind of naturally, she can come off naturally as a jerk. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that is going to be a problem, I think, because is Willow really going, or Chris really going to fit well as heels? Uh, uh, they'll probably be fine, I figure. But I don't know that they'll be great. And um, then that means you have to put everyone else in the company, anyone else that goes against Mercedes in this run as a heel, until, you know, it's probably uh, six or 12 months, maybe you can turn her heel. I think that would work. But I don't know. I just feel like right now it's not um, not the time. But that's my take. Western Kentucky leads uh, Marquette, the two seed, at the half, 43-36. Go Hilltoppers. Yeah. How far are you from uh, Western Kentucky, Fred? Shockingly far. Uh, like, you know, not that that far. But um, like a couple it, hours. it's more than you would think. It's like two, almost three hours, um, just because they are, like, pretty far out in the western part of the state. Um, I've never been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Go Hilltoppers, by the way. Uh, yeah. I think I might have already said that. I don't remember. but You did, but that's okay. It's worth this, beating. I love a football team. It's, it's fun fun yeah. school to watch. Let's kind of talk about the the uh, baby face heel dynamics here because are you really going to turn Bailey energy baby face Willow Nightingale heel? I'm not saying she couldn't do it. Yeah. I, I, I think she has the charisma to do it. It doesn't feel the right time for her. Is that worth risking right now? She's really building up a lot of momentum and turning her heel just for Monet to beat her. I think Monet's got to beat her, but I just don't know. Like, I get why you put them in a program together, but I also think it's one of those things where Tony Khan has kind of put booked himself in a little bit of a corner. Well, what do you do? Do you, you don't necessarily want to turn Mercedes Monet heel because she's just brand new to the company. Okada is a little different because Okada has been in canon for quite a while. The whole fan base knows who he is. It, they're very familiar with him. And obviously they know the history with the Young Bucks. Monet doesn't have really any history with the majority of these wrestlers. So do you risk turning her heel right away? Feels like you got to run with the baby face thing for a little bit. And then... Willow, you risk ruining her momentum because of that incredible baby face energy that she has. Where do you go? And I don't necessarily blame Tony Khan. We've seen him put himself in booking predicaments before, but it this was one that was almost unavoidable just due to uh, Monet suffering that almost career ending ankle injury against Willow. Where, where do we go from here? And I'm fascinated to find out. I think that they just need to have a match and they need to evolve the feud somehow. Maybe it's like a, maybe you like have them partner up, be like, Hey, we're good. I beat you shake hands. And then maybe you get like a, like have like a, a long-term feud started with them teaming up together. I don't really know what to do. What are you doing here? Because it's, it's a, an interesting dilemma that Tony Khan has on his hands. Yeah, I do have a pitch. Um, I think that you would have Statlander betray Willow and turn heel with Stokely. Um, and Ooh. have Willow stay baby face and Mercedes help her get revenge. Um, or maybe Chris takes out Willow and then Mercedes gets revenge on Willow's behalf. Um I think either of those is definitely preferable. Um, I do think that does create an issue, though, in the sense that, you know, Willow could use a big signature win, which she could get in that feud with Statlander. But I think, you know, that you if you do it that way, then you're setting up Mercedes getting that win, and that kind of 
you know, deprives Willow of that opportunity to get over. So, yeah. eh, I don't know. It, it's an interesting one, but overall, like, it's been a good debut, but I want to see the ring work. I want to see her get in the ring with some of these women. I want to see her in the ring with Mariah May with an actual Tony Storm, not the timeless gimmick. I want to see her in the yeah. ring with Jamie Hayter. I want to see her get involved. And to me, that's going to be a really, really fascinating instance for her and for how, how there's development. And I'm very, 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 very excited to kind of see how this looks and works. I would not be shocked if her first match ends is at Dynasty. Yeah. Oh, wait, is, is she booked in a match yet? Not yet, no. Uh, okay. They've been teasing the um, something with possibly Willow, but they haven't actually acted on that yet. So. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, I, I keep in my own head canon getting the uh, like Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander um, street fight that happened on Rampage with Julia Hart and Sky Blue in my head, Monet's in that match. I don't know why, but I can I, see this being wanna, a situation okay. where they do the CM Punk thing. He debuts on a pay per view, and then wrestles on like Rampage, and then wrestles on Collision, and then in like three months, finally wrestles on a Dynamite, and they try to try to make you pay for the first one, and then wait for the free TV appearances as far as being a wrestler. I, I think that's that's the game plan here. Maybe. maybe. Yeah, now, I, 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 uh, I... Hell, I forget. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I. it's a really interesting time. Uh, it's a really interesting situation just in terms of, well, what, what do you do with, uh, you know, with uh, Monet as far as her alignment? And it'll be, you know... I, I guess we'll have to keep, you know, just watch it. I don't have a great read on like, well, they're definitely going to go this way or that, but I think it's, you know, it's of interest, you know, something to keep an eye on. You're on mute, buddy. You're still on mute, buddy. I do that enough and there I it is. In there because I want, I want people to be able to make fun of me for it. I think we have to talk about Darby Allen first before we kind of dive into like a couple of uh, interesting news notes and the, and this dynamite show Darby Allen shoot broke his foot in the match against Jay white. And it was not from the chair shot. Um, it looked like it was from a dive to the outside, just landed weird, broke two bones in, uh, in the middle of his foot. He will no longer be climbing Mount Everest. Jay white, Claiming that he saved the life yes. of Darby Allen oh, is good. so good. And he needs to um, uh, actually put t-shirts on awshop.com. I saved Darby's life. And then on the back, like bang, bang, gang or something. I don't know. Hell yes. That is beautiful heel work. I want that in my pro wrestling. I want more of it. I need it. It's great. Uh, and it, it's really too bad for Darby that he's not going to be able to climb Mount Everest. He's not going to be able to do those things that he really wa wanted to do. And they had planned on him to be able to do that. And it's kind of sucks. Yeah. Although I will say that uh, just because it's pro wrestling, I will bring up the possibility that this was all work from the start, um, which would be hilarious. Um just super pro wrestling ish. Um, but yeah, uh, I thought that the promo from, I guess, Rampage this past Wednesday, um, no collision this week, by the way, just so everyone knows because of basketball. Um, mm -hmm. But, but the, uh, the Rampage bit with the guns and Jay White, where, you know, Jay White brags about saving Darby's life. And then they all freak out because, oh no, he's doing something dumb again. And it's just a skeleton sliding down there, slide into the pool. Um, I, I really got a kick out of that. Um, Look, he's just a shit bag heel. It's perfect. Yeah. It's, it's great. I, I I can't get enough of that stuff. Um, I feel for Darby, but let me tell you, as much as I would have loved for him to be able to do that, 
him breaking his foot as long as the foot like fully heals and him actually getting a rest, his body resting, I think is just awesome. He needs that so bad. Yeah. This dude flies into anything onto everything whenever he wrestles and get letting your body have that kind of a reset. It may make him go crazy because some people just are the kind of people where if they're stagnant, they're just get super restless and it's just, it's just bad for the psyche. But man, it, I'm glad that he's going to get a chance to like, you know, not have to throw his body around like, like a crazy man again, like for a while. It's yeah, it's good. And uh, climbing Everest is, even though it's been commercialized and it's been, you know, like kind of made into a, kind of a ridiculous experience compared to what it was like it's still hella dangerous so yeah um it's just uh i'm you know hope he recovers well and um i hope that uh you know i i hope that if he ever does do it he's very careful um with it but yeah all right, let's talk about uh, a couple news and notes. This is a little outdated right now. We'll give you the Cliff Stones version. Uh, Kevin Kelly was um, reportedly fired by AEW per the Pro Wrestling Torch. Um, Tony Khan did not comment on it in an interview with Scott Fishman of TV Insider. Um, essentially, what we know is he was fired due to um, a round of tweets on X and or tw- uh, commonly known as Twitter. Uh, talking about um, the sound of freedom, which has been uh, linked to a lot of um, QAnon supporters and him just kind of, I don't know. I don't know what the best way to say it, but um, not exactly uh, tweeting in a super um, workplace professional manner. And talking about the Ian Riccoboni stuff again, which if you don't know, Ian Riccoboni made, a couple of offhand comments about Kevin Kelly and the voice of wrestling discord. They got screenshotted because of course they did. And they made their way back to Kevin Kelly. And there's been some sour grapes from there, but just a really unfortunate situation for all parties involved because Kevin Kelly was one of my favorite uh, wrestling announcers and it wasn't really working on AEW television. Like we had hoped it would, but to kind of see the fall from grace for, any human is that like, I mean, Kevin Kelly doesn't necessarily strike me as a scumbag. Like Vince McMahon is a scumbag. His downfall was wonderful. It was great, but it's just unfortunate for so many reasons. And yeah, Yeah, I I don't think there's really much more to say about it. I will say that, uh, I don't think there's anything actually indicating that Kevin Kelly is QAnon. Uh, now, uh, if you're not familiar with what QAnon is, uh, good oh, no i was saying that the the movie is like yeah the- yeah and well and well what he took umbrage with with ian was that ian was like saying that he was supporting QAnon because he supported the movie uh the thing with the movie is it's basically about like some guy stopping child trafficking uh which has gotten a fair bit of criticism from people actually involved in stopping uh child trafficking that is not very realistic and it also kind of abuts against all the um the QAnon. Uh, actually the world is run by a, a liberal elite that all traffic children for sex uh conspiracy theory um so in some ways people see it as a intro to QAnon. um that's just the short of it um but i want to be clear that i i don't know of any reason to think that kevin kelly is actually a QAnon supporter I do think that's important to say. Uh, but yeah, that's just a whole big mess. Um, and uh, it sucks. And just never post. <laughs> Always hit delete. Um, don't get mad never online. Tweet. Never tweet. Never tweet. Um, it's It sucks that everyone is uh, upset. Um, and I just... Uh, you know, I hope that cooler heads prevail in general, but, you know, Kevin appears to be out of AEW, though Tony Khan would not confirm that for an interview, and um, 
you know, I, Kevin Kelly hasn't said anything, so you got to kind of wonder if there's an NDA involved. Um, and um, I don't know. It's just a real mess, and I hope that, you know, it works out for everyone. Uh, one thing to watch is um, I thought I saw something about the um, Walker. Oh, God, I'm, I'm, I can only think of the pitcher Walker Bueller. <laughs> The Walker for uh, New Japan is Walker it? Stewart. Walker Stewart, yes. Uh, visa but, issues, I think. Yeah, he said. Yeah, I think he tweeted something about visa issues, and it is not a good time to, for him to have visa issues. I'll just leave it at that. I don't know if anything's happening. I'm not going to like. I'm not playing that game, but I do think it's. Um, it would be a good time to make sure that if you're new to your job as the new Japan lead announcer, that your visa is in good order and you uh, stay on top of that. That would be my mm -hmm. personal advice. Uh, I'm not saying anyone's hunting for a job like beyond just maybe having more time than originally planned. I, I But I, I bet if new Japan offered the job to Kelly, he'd take it in a heartbeat and not because of any issue with anyone. It's just, he would take it, but uh, who knows? Yeah, why wouldn't he take it? He doesn't have a job right now. And look, Kevin Kelly was treated very well by New Japan from all accounts. He, it sounded like he just didn't want to keep making the flight to Japan because I think he lives in the Philadelphia area. Yeah, that's a long ass flight. Now, if you lived on the West Coast, I think that's a lot more palatable because when you live on the West Coast, well, it, you're taking about four or five hours off of that flight uh, from Philadelphia. So I don't know, but we'll kind of see how that transpires. All, all the best to Kevin Kelly in his uh, future endeavors. A um, couple more things rattle off real quick. Uh, Revolution. Um, the projection is between 170, 176,000 buys. World's end only at 141. It could be the third highest all time as all out 2021 did 205. All in did 200. And Revolution 2022, which was the Punk MJF dog collar match, did 175K, over a million dollar gate. Good for AEW there. CJ Perry and Miro have separated per TMZ. Neither one has worked since World's End. Um, but apparently, I think uh, Miro might be hurt. So that probably plays into it as well. Um, and... I think that's pretty much it. Uh, next battle of the belts will be in Highland, Kentucky, which is essentially a suburb of Cincinnati. Uh, yeah. If you don't and, know, uh, just in general, uh, the, the Cincinnati airport is actually in Kentucky, just to give you an idea geographically. So. Which is very funny to me. Yes, it um, is. <laughs> also, I, I don't know. Uh, this happened after we, our quasi recording last week. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry Lawler was honored by the Memphis Grizzlies. And who runs in? Hell but yes. Jeff Jarrett. I don't know if this is leading J -E. anywhere. J-E. <laughs> Double F. J-E. Double F. Double F. Double baby. Um, I thought that was. What a, what a guy. <laughs> that was awesome. And you know what? We make fun of Jeff Jarrett. And we don't really make fun of him because we think he's awesome. But. He's got a long background in Memphis, especially with his dad, Jerry, who mm -hmm. uh, worked Memphis for a while. Look, I think this rocks. I don't know if this is going to end up going anywhere. I don't think that Jerry Lawler could take a bump, but what a I don't think he should. Memphis crowd, man. I'll tell you who could take a bump, though, is Jeff Jarrett. Have Jerry Lawler come on AEW and punch him. Uh, that would be fantastic, but I, I don't believe that. Um, Do another concession stand brawl and have Jerry Law throw a hot dog in his face. Or a fireball, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I can't imagine Lawler appearing on AEW just because of he probably would have a sense of loyalty to WWE. But frankly, if he did or did something with JR, I, I think that'd be really cool. And now remember, Jerry is recovering from um, uh, a stroke he had, I think, last year. But yeah, I, I hope he's doing well. But it just sounds like a cool little thing that happened, which is neat. Yeah, very neat. Um, all right, let's talk about this dynamite. Uh, we've already talked about a few things here, so I I think the one thing that we really need to hit on here, Fred, the I Quit match. Pretty good. What did you think of the I Quit match? 
I liked it. Um, I went four on it, so that's that's a, like a great match to me. Uh, I for a little bit I was like, is this going to hit four and a quarter? But I thought there was just, and it makes sense with the story they did and everything. I'm not knocking it. I'm just I thought that it just kept it from getting higher. That all the shenanigans at the end kind of, um, you know, just kept it from hitting a higher level that it may have been approaching at one point. Uh, you know, that's just my opinion. Um, I think that um, it was a, it was a really good match. Uh, but one thing I will note is that they were they were generally smart um, about how they uh, did bumps. They uh, did mm-hmm. not, uh, you know, they teased the ladder and they te- you know they teased all the tables and everything and like they used them, but there weren't anything on there that was really insane and um i thought it was you know i thought it was a good match a pretty safe match and um pretty good work by uh pretty good work by the guys i thought um it's not going to be like a match of the year contender at all but i enjoyed it so i really did too i gave it four and a quarter and you know what gave it that extra quarter star the the hockey jersey spot just fun off great um boston and toronto are both original six franchises and bitter rivals yes when adam copeland starts putting the boston bruins jersey on christian and then christian just fully puts the thing on just look i don't care if it's contrived that was blatantly for the toronto crowd edge or sorry copeland was wearing Maple Leafs inspired gear through yeah. and through just perfect. Just great heel stuff. Just like, Oh, I know this is a Boston Bruins Jersey. This is going to piss off the fans. This is going to piss off Copeland. Hell yeah. This rocks like just little things like that. I thought uh, the use of spike and just kicking him in the nuts over and over again was awesome. Uh, Matt Menard and Daniel Garcia coming down. I thought was great too. And I thought it was really telling when Daniel Garcia was like congratulating him. He just kept hitting the title. So Mm -hmm. I think that's your next program, which I'm okay with. I thought it was perfect that you had all the two male members of the patriarchy uh, handcuffed to the turnbuckles. And then mother Wayne is about to be handcuffed and she runs away like a pansy. I thought it was just perfect for the story. Look, is it contrived? Sure, but it's pro wrestling. Everything's fucking contrived. Who cares at this point? Like, I I had a lot of fun, and it was a conclusive end. You had the I quit, and I had a good time. Now, Copeland sounds like he's bringing back the Cope Open, which I am also a very big fan of. I've been very vocal about that he should be bringing back the Cope Open and doing it, because it's like just do the Cody gimmick. Just have good TV matches, three and a half to four and a quarter star matches every single week while you kind of figure out what's next for you and this program. Like, I love it. I, this was a very fitting end. I still wish it was a ladder match, but they, they did the ladders. They did the concerto. They had a table. Hard to complain. The, the I quit stuff really bugs me when Bryce Remsburg's like, do you quit? Do you quit? It is you too many times. Face. Yeah. Jeez, just just have the ring mic'd up a little better and then turn up those mics or something. I don't know. There you could do a better job. I'm, I think I'm nitpicking at that point. Good match, good way to end the feud. But also, where does the patriarchy go from here? That's an interesting question. They've obviously teased kill switch turning, and I do expect that the next program will probably be Christian versus Kill Switch, with Kill Switch uh going back to Luchasaurus. Uh, and be in the baby face, of course, but uh, I guess we'll see. Um, I guess we'll see if they do something in the interim. You know, they could definitely do another program where Christian goes over, uh, but there's some like miscommunications with uh, Luchasaurus along the way and uh, leading to you know more um, beef between the two before they actually pull the trigger. Uh, but you know, sometimes uh. Sometimes AEW rushes storylines like that. So Mm -hmm. I guess we will see. But I think that, you know, I think that's in the near future, if not necessarily imminent. Yeah. 
I'm curious to kind of uh, put a wrap on everything with, with dynamite because there's a, uh, this was for the most part outside of the big stuff that we already talked about. It's kind of a nothing show. I think we have to talk about hook versus Jericho. Clunky. This was yeah. There's clunky like, stuff around. <laughs> like they even mentioned, I think hooking out is 55 matches in his career and Jericho's got over 2,700. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, dog there was no chemistry here and it was frustrating from that aspect they tried hook just no, isn't there yet it wasn't bad i don't think i want to say it was a below average match but it was uh it was not fantastic this is going to sound derogatory and i don't mean it as such hook is aew's versions of nxt 2.0 like or level up the the young yeah. wrestlers have like twenty matches under the belt, stinking on national television. This is their version of it. Hook is just a little bit more refined. And they've done a really good job of hiding him up until now. Now you're really starting to get see some of these things exposed. You saw it a little bit in the tag match last week. You saw it in the scramble, and you saw it uh, against Jericho. There is just a lot of raw and green elements to hook. There's a lot of good, which is why they put so much time into him. Yeah. But you have to understand that there is, there's going to be these kind of matches. I and, think he's, I think, and I also think he's gotten a little exposed um, over the past few weeks with Jericho feud. I think uh, just showing some of the holes in this game, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's okay to have holes in your game. Hook is what? Yeah. 25 years old. He has less than 60 matches. There's plenty of time for him to be able to figure this stuff out and get it. I mean, his dad is Taz. I think he's going to figure it out, especially with all the raw ability and talent that we've seen so far. The problem is you're having this guy do it on national television against some of the best to ever do it. You have him have that kind of match against Jericho. It's like, okay, Maybe we shouldn't be giving this guy some kind of rocket pack right now. And you know what? I need to eat some crow because I think I, I said a lot of really good things about hook after that Samoa Joe match. Well, I, I think we've seen a little bit of regression from that. And, and you know what? That's okay. But I think we just need to be real about where he's at and get him in a position to succeed instead of allowing him to quote unquote fail. Because I gave this a gentleman's three because I thought they worked really hard, but the match wasn't very good. No. It was clunky. Like the moves were technically fine, but getting to them was rough. And Jericho did hit a nice lion salt though. That yeah, was nice. He did. He, he did he it right did. this time. He did not uh, almost die. Thank the Lord. I, I'm genuinely scared. He's going to snap his neck or and or spine doing a lion. Salt. I think he should retire it. It's not. It, there's a lot more issues than successes with it these days and it's just yeah. a dangerous move and like it's not like uh you know you're throwing a a drop kick or something or a lariat mm-hmm. and it you know it doesn't look great sometimes like we're talking about a a move pull where you invert- don't do it on a dynamite match like pull it out on a pay-per-view okay that's i get it do you really need to do a lion salt against hook yeah he i think he does need to do it less if not just completely stop um but um yeah i i you know i think there's reason to i'm not saying like give up on hook let's be clear because that would be foolish i think he's got enough good that he's worthy of being built up as a potential future star i at the same time think that um you know i think that maybe chris jericho is not the guy to partner with him uh not because of any kind of oh he's gonna drain his heat or something like that uh, I just think that, um, and, but I will also say, I do think we are seeing Jericho show his age. Uh, I think I've been fairly consistently saying that over the past year. Now, what I think they could do to at least enliven him a little bit is have him, uh, turn heel on hook. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I think that he needs to turn heel. Um, and I think that, you know, they're potentially setting something up next week where that'll happen. Uh, I think he could very easily, um, you know, you know, betray him, you know, be like, oh, we're going to do a segment in the ring and then just, you know, 
kick, hit a low blow or something, you know, just be a jerk. Yeah. Um, and I think that we need that for Jericho to be relevant on AEW because I feel like for almost, I don't know if it's a year now, but for several months, like it's really notable that Chris Jericho, who was like the first major star to sign with the company, uh, at least like non new Japan edition, right. Um, has uh, felt kind of aimless in AEW, and that's, kind of surprising just because he's such a big deal to the company but i do think his time as like a world champion level guy is passed by but i mm-hmm. think you still need to find a spot to use him in and you know i think that they had settled on something with the omega tag team and then omega went on tv while trying not to die <laughs> at a bad promo um but i i just feel like maybe there's a possibility that Jericho is a, a man completely out of time, and, uh, like in regards to where AEW is right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's something to watch going forward how they use him, uh, how he is positioned. Um, I'm not calling for him to just job to a different guy every week, but I do think this could be a great way to put over Hook or just get Jericho going as a heel. That matters some to the company. You know what I would like to see send him on a Fozzie tour for six months. And I, I don't mean that as insulting. He just hasn't really had any time away from the company since the company formed. And yeah. one of the best parts about AEW since its inception is guys will rotate in and out. You won't see the elite for a couple of weeks. You won't see uh, somebody like Miro for a couple of months. Now that's a different scenario, but it, it kind of plays into the larger point. Guys will go away. And then when they come back, you're a little bit more invested because they feel a little fresher. They don't feel like you've seen them every single week and you just run out of stories. Like that happens in pro wrestling. That's why the territory era was so great because you'd have Ric Flair in Georgia for two months and then he'd go somewhere else. And that was so awesome because you, things felt fresh. It felt rejuvenated. You didn't see the same match week in and week out. You didn't see the same things. I want to see more of that. I want to see more guys cycling it out. And I think Jericho needs to be one because beating him doesn't feel the same as it did when like, like, yeah, it was a Mimosa Mayhem match. Orange Cassidy beating him felt like a big deal. Eddie yeah. Kingston beating him felt like a big deal. Did anybody care that hook beat him? Did it matter to anybody? Was it a big deal? Was it this like, Hey, I finally got like the big one. No, because Jericho has just been his value has decreased because he's a constant. He's always doing something. And I want to see a little bit of evolution in that sense. And I think he should go away for a little while. And it's, it's not his fault. It's not that Jericho has been bad. Overexposure is a real thing in pro wrestling. And I just think he's been overexposed. Yeah, I think that they definitely need to at least reinvent his direction. If not, um, you know, if not, maybe give him a break. But yeah. Fred, anything else you want to talk about before we get out of here today? Uh, not particularly. Um, uh, Anthony Henry broke his jaw uh, about two weeks ago now. Um, so he's going to be out of action for a bit. He had ab surgery. Uh I saw a report in the Observer that Commander was hurt in his match with Takeshita, but it's not clear exactly what that injury is. So, you know. And no, other than that, I think that's about everything that's been happening in AEW. So, there's one more thing I want to mention. Oh, there's one more thing I want to mention, but you go ahead. Why are we booking Swerve Strickland versus Kanosuke Takeshita on Dynamite? Why why are we booking ourselves into a corner again? You Takeshita should not be losing. And neither should Swerve. Swerve's about to wrestle for the title. And I swear, if this is a Takeshita pin Swerve and we get another fucking three-way, I'm going to lose my mind. I don't get that vibe. I don't get that vibe. I I don't either. But why are we booking this match? What what is the point? I think Tony Khan is okay beating Takeshita right now. Um, Why? Why why do we have to continue to beat Takeshita? He was beaten like a drum before the heel turn. And now you have all this momentum. He he pins Kenny Omega twice in like a 14-day span. And now we're just back to just pinning him. Like I think Swerve has to win, but yeah, I agree with you. I I feel why like why are we booking the match? Why? I don't know. <laughs> why are you yelling at me? I agree. Um, I, I don't have a great reason. I mean, it'll be a great match. Let's be clear. But 
I don't see why uh I don't see why it's gotta be Takesh in the spot. I, I figure you could find a different heel that is uh you know, in a position where you could better lose but still have a good match. Um Powerhouse Hobbs, Kyle Fletcher. You have two in your not Hobbs. And I feel like Fletcher's lost too much, and he's a champion technically in Ring of Honor, which I, we all know means a lot in AEW booking. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I can't say it's a, it's necessarily the the right time for that match. It felt like if they waited on that, that could have been a big deal, uh, especially after one assumes Swerve wins the belt. Mm-hmm. Just frustrating. What was the one thing you wanted to say, Fred? Uh, collision match uh, this past week. Uh, Danielson and Shibata. That ruled. Oh, that was, that was fun. really good. I, I got to watch that this morning, and uh, I went like four and a half on it. I thought it just ripped. Um, unsurprisingly, but I, I I had a blast watching that. So you could just tell, and I, this is not an insult. Danielson is just a mark for some of these guys. And it, it comes out in these matches because he's just so happy to be wrestling them that like you remember Samoa Joe versus Kenta Kobashi mm-hmm. and Samoa Joe's getting the machine gun chops in the corner and he's just smiling. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of got a little bit of that from Danielson in this match. He's wrestling Shibata and he's just like smirking. Oh, he's grinning after the match is over, and like that didn't really feel like a cafe grin. Uh, he's got that huge hematoma on his shoulder too, from all the kicks and chops too. So, but yeah, that was uh, it was a great match. I, I just had to mention that real quick. But yeah, that's it. That's me. This company rules right now. It's it's a really it's fun so time. Fun. It really is fun. Yeah, and we will be back next week to have more conversations and talk about what the hell Tony Khan is going to do with this uh, Swerve Strickland and. I don't even remember who he's facing. Oh, Kanosuke Takesha. I'm I'm just so mad about it that I forgot the names. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, please remember to like and give us a five star review to help us promote. Uh, I don't even know how popular we are in the country of Turkey right now, but I hope it's still high. Oh, it um, was still high when we actually put out an episode and didn't ruin it. Yeah, that oh, oh, we think we fixed <laughs> the audio issues now. I'm Tyler. He's Fred. Thank you. You're going to have to check it before we release. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Take, Take care. care, everyone. See y'all. Hola, hola. My name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí.